Okay, thank you. So welcome everyone to Grand Rounds and uh, hope everyone is doing well. Um, I think you know, your partner Mess is doing a great job of stepping up. I'm very proud of everybody and very proud of our learners um, as well as the faculty and our, our staff and the nursing colleagues and the whole team. So things are evolving of course every day, but um, really important that we continue to focus on our educational missions, which I think we are doing very well. So today's Grand Round, I think is really topical. It's you know, an update on the internal medicine GME. And we have an all-star cast. So we have Stephanie Call, who of course you all know. And I think a good time to know that Stephanie won um, awards for teaching, but for I think bravery in teaching. And Stephanie's done just a tremendous job in taking care of patients on the front line, as well as leading us all in, in our educational missions at this time when it's, things are a bit different than usual. But um, one thing is not different, that we continue to focus and education continues to be a major priority in the Department of Medicine, and that will never change. Um, Rebecca Miller um, is going to help us. You know, obviously, we all know she's the Associate Program Director and uh, stepped up just a few weeks ago to do Grand Rounds. So you're back in the hot seat, Rebecca. <laughs> Becky, thank you for doing that. Alex Rittenberg, um, one of our hospital medicine um, physicians, is going to um, be part of this panel. And as you know, he's involved in the hospital medicine and um, teaching initiatives with medical students and residents. And completing the panel is Claire Kimberly, who is a research coordinator and is very well published in the areas of well-being and education um, and a great asset to our department. So I'm really looking forward to getting this grand round and uh, welcome everybody. So glad that you're able to join us. I think we have 45 folks uh, online. And uh, although we're not there in person, we're thinking about everyone and glad we can stay in touch through these educational initiatives. So I think maybe Stephanie's kicking this off. No, actually, um, it'll be Claire Kimberly. Oh, so I will start us off. Yes, that is entirely fine. I am actually trying to share my screen real quick. So if you will give me just a second, you should be able to see the opening slide there on your screen. Thank you again, everyone, for your time. I know that is very valuable right now, so we will um, definitely make the most of it. To begin, um, if you saw the advertisement for this, you know where we're going. We're going to start off with understanding a method for collecting and interpreting medical education literature, and then the co-presenters are actually going to give you a summary of, of the education research studies that we have found this year, published in this year. Um, I did have a note here just to say that we will be looking at the chat screen when we're done with each portion of our presentations to answer any questions. So feel free to, to ask any questions in the chat box and we will get to them um, as soon as we are finished. So I, again, I'm just the research coordinator for this project. So I'm the one that kind of helped organize and manage to help our co-presenters present um, accurate information. So where we started was we did a PubMed search with the assistance of John Cyrus in our, our library. And he used these key terms there at the bottom of your screen now, you can see those, um, but we also tried to narrow it down to make sure they were educational studies, 2019 English, and also done in the US and Canada. So that was our criteria set for getting um, our first round of articles. So when we collected the, the articles from John Cyrus, um, we did have some limitations just up front, wanted to share those with you. As we all know, there are differences in when you get an article published, whether or not it's published online first, whether or not it's published in press, the exact year that it's published can vary. So even though we did a search for 2019, um, there is obviously uh, the case where we may have articles that are published technically in 2020 um, is when we can access them, but they were published in 2019. So we will be missing some of those. But our last search was done on January 31st to try to get as many that we can. Um, so just note that we might have missed some due to those limitations. Here is an overview. I'm going to try to use my mouse so that you can follow me because this is summarizing a lot of work um, quickly. So it can be confusing. But we received 628 original articles from John Cyrus from the library. And we had two external reviewers or 
reviewers in our team um, actually look at those abstracts to make sure that they fell into this category um, that we're trying to be in. So the internal medicine and general med ed medical education literature. And so those two reviewers would go through the abstracts and look and make sure that they fell into our categories. We also need them to be um, quantitative studies and I'll discuss why that is in just a second. Um, so we did need to eliminate um, mostly qualitative studies. So the two reviewers would go through and they would make sure that all of those articles um, fell into those categories. And when we reviewed them, that eliminated 181 articles. There were some disagreements between the two external reviewers on whether or not they should be included. And so when that was the case, we had a third person come in and um, be the tiebreaker, if you will, to make that final decision whether or not it should be included. But you'll see there at your bottom left that we did have 90% agreement between those two people reviewing the abstracts of whether or not it should be included. So it's pretty high agreement whether or not. Um, you can see on your right here, um, the not focus on internal medicine, those are the categories that um, directed us to exclude those abstracts. So that got us to 181 articles. And those were reviewed by external reviewers. We'll get to them in just a second. But when they reviewed the articles, they too found some that did not fall into our category. So being mostly qualitative, um, you can see the breakdown there on the right hand side and that excluded 12 more articles. So our final review of articles were 169. Um, so that's where we felt that they all um, fell into our general medical education internal mess and published in 2019 for mostly qualitative quantitative um, information. So once we got to that area of 181, 169 articles, um, we had every single paper reviewed um, using the Mursky tool. So the Mursky tool, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is the medical education um, research study quality instrument. Um, this is a way that we can measure whether or not the article should be produced um, and how wonderful and, and uh, progressive it is. It's just a tool that we can use to kind of measure that. And so they have 10 items um, in six domains listed there on your screen and the highest score that they can get is 18. Some sample questions that they had that they reviewed included response rates, uh, making sure the response rate was fairly high. If they had 75% or higher response rate, then they received the highest score possible in that particular domain or that question. Um, another one was appropriateness of data analysis. So those are some example questions. And if you're interested more in the tool, then just let me know and I can definitely share that information with you. But we do know that this Mercy tool is pretty well validated. Um, it does predict editorial decisions for manuscripts. Um, scores also reliably identify areas of methodological strengths and weaknesses. So that was the reason why we chose that tool to help us understand the articles that we have um, concluded with. So going back to that chart that was earlier, we had those 169 articles that were all reviewed using this tool. So these were external reviewers from 21 different institutions. So we had 27 total reviewers from 21 different institutions. We have at the end of the presentation here, a list of their names and locations. So if you're interested in who all did the reviewing, you can see that there. But they had all been trained on using the Mercy tool. We developed an online training platform. And then also they reviewed sort of these sample articles um, to test whether or not they were accurately using the tool. And so when they apply the tool to those sample articles, they had to get 90% or higher on, on their score to be able to continue with us as a reviewer. Most of them did, so not a problem. It was a little awkward, you know, saying thank you for your time. I'm not sure if, if you're best suited for, for doing this stage, uh, but most of them were able to continue with us. So the total was 27 reviewers. And those 27 reviewers um, looked at those 169 full articles and gave us those um, scores using the Mercy tool. So again, going to the, the upper range of 18. Um, down. So with that, um, we had a nice pretty Excel document um, that had all of the articles ranked um, with the Mursky tool. And we took that top quartile, which is about 42 articles, 
um, the ones that scored the highest. And we looked for themes, so just commonality of the um, articles and what topics they were covering. And that is where we'll enter into our next stage of the presentation with our presenters. They're actually going to discuss the articles that fell into these three broad themes. Um, I believe that Dr. Becky Miller is next, so I will hand it over to her, but feel free again to send me e any emails or any information you need about the process we got to discussing these final articles. Sorry, I'm just going to advance um, at, through our initial slides. And um, don't forget to submit questions via the chat um, about particular articles or themes. Uh, as we go along, we'll pause between each section for questions. I'm going to be discussing three articles that focused on understanding resident work hours and time. We all know uh, that this is a very hot topic in medical education um, over the last decade or more and really uh, not only optimizing the time that residents spend at work, but also understanding the outcomes related to that, including patient care outcomes, resident well-being outcomes, and educational outcomes. So first I'm going to discuss uh, patient safety outcomes under flexible and standard resident duty hour rules. Uh, this came out of the iCompare research group and was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in March of 2019. This is one of several different uh, articles that describes outcomes from this from the iCompare study, and I'm actually going to be talking about two of them today. Uh, as a reminder, iCompare stands for the Individualized Comparative Effectiveness of Models Optimizing Patient Safety and Resident Education. Uh, their primary question was, how do 2011 ACGME work hour regulations impact patient safety, resident education, resident, as well as resident sleep and alertness compared to more flexible work hours? In this first article, we will look at the impact on patient safety outcomes. Uh, a review of the study design, uh, this was a national cluster randomized trial conducted in academic year 2015-16. I remember it very well as a chief resident uh, at that time in this program, and we were in the flexible arm of this trial, and I was the scheduling chief, so I was intimately familiar with our flexible scheduling. Uh, the sample size was 63, uh, and... Um, and this was based on sort of the, the number of programs needed um, on uh, in patient, the hypothesis around patient mortality. Uh, for, for the differences in the flexible and standard groups, uh, primarily in the flexible group, the uh, requirement to not exceed 16 hours of work at a time for interns and 24 hours for residents uh, was taken away, as well as um, that all residents had to have 14 hours off after a 24-hour shift or 8 to 10 hours off after any other shift. So those restrictions were taken away. Both groups still had to adhere to no more than 80 hours per week and had one day off in seven and no uh, more frequent than every three days of in-house overnight call. So our study population uh, were the, within these residency programs, uh, they had to have at least one affiliated hospital at their in their program that was um, in the upper half of resident to bed ratios and in the upper three quartiles of patient volumes for 17 pre-specified medical conditions, which I'll show you on another slide. And uh, they also had to ha have a hospital that the program director had designated it, that a flexible schedule would be implemented if they were selected to be in the flexible arm. We, the patients that were assessed in this uh, for the patient safety outcomes were pulled from Medicare claims uh, to ins ensure uniformity among um, sort of the, those uh, safety outcomes. They looked at patients that were 65 years of age admitted with one of the 17 conditions during academic year 2014-15, so the pre-trial year and the trial year. And they included only the first admission for each year. Uh, and and the Medicare free, they had to have been in the Medicare fee for service for at least six months before that index admission and 30 days after. Their primary outcome uh, for this particular study was looking at uh, the difference between the changes in unadjusted 30 day mortality from the pre trial year to the trial year. So they're looking at a difference um, in the difference between the flexible and the standard group. 
and they were looking for that the and they were looking to see that the non or that the flexible group um, outcomes were non inferior to the standard group. They also looked at risk adjusted 30 day mortality and safety measures such as readmission or death within seven and 30 days after discharge, the rate of at least one patient safety indicator using AHRQ criteria, payments made by Medicare, and rate of prolonged length of hospital stay. They, they did a subgroup analysis looking specifically at patients on services that were supposed to be using the flexible schedules. So they were able to look at 264,585 admissions over the pre-trial and trial year. Um, ultimately, um, at least 78% of those had one admission during this time that was or that qualified for this study, and some had more. There was only a slight difference in the age of patients between the years, and otherwise the patient demographics were similar, and the diagnoses between the group were similar. And this is a list of the 17 uh, qualifying medical conditions. So in, in this study, they saw that there was, that the change in 30-day mortality between the pretrial and the trial year was not inferior to that, and in, in the flexible group was not inferior to that in the standard group. They saw other um, outcomes that were not inferior, including the risk-adjusted 30-day mortality, um, as well as risk-adjusted 30-day admissions, and unadjusted and risk-adjusted analyses of seven-day readmissions, patient safety indicators, um, and Medicare payments. And looking at the analysis of the flexible shift, Ultimately, they were only able to analyze uh, 10,500 patients that were definitively exposed to a flexible schedule. Uh, and they did this by uh, using provider MPI numbers that were attending on services that should, uh, that were potentially using the flexible shift, and then compared to the schedule provided by the residency program of when the flexible shifts were utilized. Um, and so they Basically, we're looking at the attending physicians who potentially were uh, supervising residents uh, in a flexible schedule. And they found that also in, in the flexible, in, in the subgroup, that the risk-adjusted 30-day mortality and Medicare payments were not inferior, but differences in 7-day and 30-day readmissions and prolonged length of hospital stay uh, did not meet criteria for non-inferiority. Um, so there are some limitations to this study, and one, one um, that I did not list here but is important to note is that for all of the outcomes, they used the same, um, let me go back here, they used the same non-inferiority margin of 1%. So for patient safety uh, indicators, those were very, very low to start with, and so a margin of less than 1% is very generous and may not actually, if it if, and so saying that it's not inferior um, may be kind of giving it too much, allowing too much difference to be there. And the opposite for prolonged length of hospital stay, so um, where the, the percentage of patients was relatively high, so saying that the, if they didn't meet criteria for that, um, it may be um, not truly non-inferior. It's just that that margin was too small. So that was one limitation, and I did want to mention that. Um, but also, it was really difficult to assess if the patients um, that, whose outcomes were compared truly uh, were taken care of um, by trainees when they were actually working an extended shift. So there was variable implementation of extended shifts. For example, in our program, we implemented 24-hour uh, call in the ICUs only and only on weekends. So um, it was very difficult from this study for, the, for um, them to know definitively that a patient was taken care of by a trainee when they were working in an extended shift and they were using um, as best they could the schedules available along with the supervising physician to, dis to determine this. And um, most... Uh, most used um, 
the flexible shifts or extended shifts for some rotations, but not all. So they may have not used an extended shift of 24 hours, but just said you can that interns could work more than 16 hours. And the use of, of extended shifts varied widely among all the flexible programs. We were allowed to implement sort of any model that we wanted, um, and it was not uniform between the programs. And, and the shift links still were not extreme. So implications behind this, so this, you know, in this study, we saw that there was no apparent harm to patient with, um, who were seen um, in the flex, under the flexible hour scheduling, although I would say the subgroup analysis was really less convincing. Um, it, this does show us that the nature of standard regulations may not really be, uh, the standard regulations may not have been relevant to the current program models, which were structured already to optimize um, patient safety uh, within sort of an 80-hour work week. And, and within an 80-hour work week and not having more than one and three days of overnight call, um, so the flexible hour, the flexible groups really weren't that much different than the standard groups because of the 80 hour, one day off in seven and Q3 hour, or Q3 24 hour call. Uh, but this did support allowing program directors to have more discretion with scheduling um, without those continuous duty hour limitations. Um, and, and it may show that those may, doing so may not worsen patient outcomes, but we can't say definitively. Uh, next, we're going to look at sleep and alertness in a duty hour flexibility trial in internal mm -hmm. medicine. This was also out of the iCompare group and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Had a scaled Mersky of 17 out of 18, and I think this was actually our highest scoring article. I should have emphasized the previous article had a scaled Mersky of 14.3. So um, this paper focuses on the impact of sleep and alertness um, outcomes in comparing the flexible versus the standard uh, duty hour regulations. The same design. Um, this is also a non-inferiority design. Uh, and they looked at, in this study, uh, over a 14-day period, sleep duration using actigraphy, uh, sleepiness using a validated scale, uh, and they looked at alert, alertness using a psychomotor vigilant test in interns. They, this was done in a subgroup of 12 medium to large programs, six from the standard group and six from the flexible group. And uh, it included interns who were rotating on general medicine, cardiology, or critical care rotations. These interns were recruited by the program coordinators at the beginning of the year. And then based on their schedule, the program coordinators put them on, um, the, assigned when they would uh, be assessing these outcomes based on their schedule. Um, and the rotation, and they, if they were in the flexible arm, they were. This was done on rotations using the flexible duty hour standards between November and May of 16. They were given ten out, ten dollars a day in gift cards for every day of data they, they uh, gave back. Um, at the beginning of the day, they did a brief survey saying what type of shift they had worked. They logged their sleep, um, sort of manually, and they also scored the quality of their sleep from one to five. They identified um, periods where they felt excessively sleepy, and then they completed this Karolinska sleepiness scale in the survey. And then they performed a psycho psychomotor vigilant test, looking for performance lapses to assess their alertness. Data from 205 interns in the flexible program and 193 in the standard programs was collected. 97% of the interns in the flexible programs were reported that they had done at least one extended overnight shift during that 14-day period. Uh, there was no di difference in demographics or completeness of data, which is actually very good for this type of study. It's been um, done on a smaller scale, uh, in, and it's actually really hard to get complete data in this type of study, just as an aside. Um, so looking at the outcomes of sleep duration, sleepiness, and alertness, um, there uh, was the, between the flexible programs and the standard programs for the mean hours of sleep and the mean Karolinska sleepiness scale score, uh, the flexible programs were not inferior to the standard programs, and but in the mean performance lapses or the alertness, um, they did not, the flexible programs did not meet criteria for um, non-inferiority. 
And this represents a composite across all shift types, but they did look at it by shift type, which I'll show you in another slide. So this is a graph um, in, the, in the first square. They're looking at uh, day two of an extended overnight shift, um, looking at the percent of um, interns who were sleeping in the standard versus the flexible group. Um, this square looks compares sleep um, in day one of an extended overnight shift in the flexible versus the standard group. C is a regular day shift, and D is on days off. Um, so you can see that in general, sleep duration varied among shift types, um, and that sleep duration was the shortest during extended shifts with an average of five hours. Uh, we did see that there were um, there was decreased alertness with more performance lapses. Um, the sleepiness scores and frequency of excessive sleepiness were maximal at the end of an extended 24-hour shift, and the quality of sleep during um, what, during an extended shift was lower than the day before. So kind of putting this all together, we saw that sleep duration and sleepiness was not inferior with extended um, shifts or in the flexible group, I guess you could say, although the flexible group wasn't always working extended shifts. Um, and interns in the flexible programs were able to compensate in sleep loss, um, so that total duration wasn't necessarily impacted, likely due to the concurrent regulations as we discussed before. But that acute sleep loss and circadian misalignment after an extended shift did reduce alertness um, and impact sleepiness following an extended shift. Uh, and so we saw as a result of all of the findings in iCompare that program directors were given more flexibility in scheduling shift types for interns, allowing for extended 24-hour shifts um, and taking away the maximum of 16 hours duration. Um, but uh, this does show us that we should consider that impact of an extended shifts on alertness, which could ultimately impact safety, um, putting that all together. So, you know, we did see the total duration wasn't necessarily changed, but there is there are acute changes at the end of an extended shift that can impact safety and physician well-being. So those should be used judiciously and with sort of caution. Um, and following up on this is a smaller study with a scaled MERSKI of 13.2, where they looked at the metabolic demands of internal medicine residency, and they were really focusing on changes in um, what they described as the me metabolic demands um, between different types of shifts. And this was actually done in Canada. Um, we reviewed studies that were done in the U.S. and Canada. Their question was, what are the physiologic demands of internal medicine training during residency, and what is the average sleep and physical activity of internal medicine residents while on and off call? And they considered on call, as I'll show you, to be an extended shift. This was done in uh, a single quaternary care center in British Columbia between November of 2011 and March of 2016. Um, they assessed PGY1, 2, and 3 residents on inpatient internal medicine um, teaching services, who were working five consecutive days, and that had to include at least one on-call on shift. And they were excluded if they were taking modafinil. Um, that was their only exclusion criteria. Uh, the, the resident self-reported uh, their sex, age, height, weight, and race. Um, they were wearing armbands, which measured their activity in sleep. Um, during those five consecutive days. And, uh, and on this slide, I describe what is a non-call day, so working 7.45 a.m. to 5 p.m. On-call was essentially uh, 24 hours, and post-call was 7.45 a.m. to 10 a.m., and then excused until the following day. They looked at calories burned per day, steps per day, average METs per hour, and hours of activity on these different shifts, as well as hours of sleep, and notably sleep efficiency. So we had uh, 40 subjects enrolled, 22 ultimately completed the study. So you can see it's a much smaller study, which is consistent, I think, with other studies of this nature where it's difficult to get complete data, as I mentioned. And they had a mean age of 31, a mean BMI of 23, and worked on average 52 hours over this five-day period. About 60% were PGY1s and 64% were female. So looking at the comparison and the average metabolic parameters, they compared these using a one-way repeated um, ANOVA analysis. 
So on activity, um, there was a significant difference between call days, post-call days, and non-call days, with activity being the highest in that call day, which was an extended shift. Also burning um, considerably more calories um, and taking significantly more steps and having higher METs per hour on call days compared to post-call and non-call days. Looking at sleep, they had an average of 1.2 hours of sleep on call days and 8.7 on post-call as well as 6 on, on um, non-call days. And sleep efficiency uh, was also assessed. And so you can see that there was a significant difference in hours per day slept um, and not a difference in sleep efficiency. But the, the, they noted that there was significantly higher sleep in a post-call day, um, so allowing to uh, account for some of the sleep debt that occurred on the call day. There were limitations, obviously. This is a very small sample size. And I just wanted to note that the schedule model may not necessarily correlate to all other training programs, uh, other than they did really look at that extended shift, which is, I think, what we have um, the most questions about, but their uh, non-call days may have been a little shorter than many other training programs on an inpatient medicine service. Um, so we did see that on-call days significantly affect metabolic demand, sleep duration, and sleep efficiency, but that the current models did allow for some compensation in the metabolic demands and sleep duration on the post-call days but it was unclear if that compensation was really enough to completely restore the sleep ener energy or debt, and that sleep efficiency was impacted but did not um, change considerably uh, between the days. So, um, you know, you might expect that or hope that they had increased sleep efficiency in their post-call days to help account for that sleep debt um, and decrease in, compare in their, in their post-call day, but we did not see that. So... Um, just to note, I think we, we recognize this, but this study was one of the first that really looked at sleep efficiency, and it just takes home that point that the duration of the sleep um, may not necessarily be an, a surrogate, an adequate surrogate to assess um, fatigue, and, and even if you're getting adequate sleep, and that taking into account the efficiency of the sleep um, is important as well, too. Um, and again, this may support judicious use of extended shifts. So while I compared it and find significant um, harmful outcomes to patient safety or resident well-being, um, this again supports that there, are, there is an impact of extended shifts. So it, if they are used, it should be judi judiciously um, is, is sort of my assessment of these findings. So with that, if we have time, um, I can uh, review any questions we have in the chat so I can pull it. So I see, I assume the requirement to be in Medicare 30 days after admission did not include patients who died during that admission. Yes. Um, and so the second question, yes, oh, just address, okay. And then there's a link to the sleepiness score for anyone interested. Any other questions I can answer? Okay, all right, I'll let Alex take it away. All right, I'm just gonna move this out of the way. So our next set of articles are those that may have flown under the radar in 2019, but these were the ones that were designed so well that we had to make sure that they were included in this study. Um, these aren't gonna be the necessarily the bigger articles, but these are the ones that we hope are doable, the ones that are gonna inspire food for thought uh, and more high quality medical education research and internal medicine. So teaching diagnostic reasoning is an essential component of residency education. Our first study by Harris and colleagues from the University of Iowa um, implements a novel bolus booster approach to their diagnostic reasoning curriculum. Their study asks the question whether using a longitudinal curriculum beginning with an initial week-long bolus and then sustained throughout the academic career as a, uh, with repeated exposures improves resident self-assessment of their diagnostic reasoning skills. 
An expert panel of medical educators from the University of Iowa implemented this curriculum in the fall of 2015. House staff received an initial week-long bolus composed of interactive workshops taught by core faculty. Um, and these included the underlying cognitive theory of diagnostic reasoning, terminology, interactive practice cases through team-based learning, review of biases, and then deliberate practice um, of diagnostic reasoning. And then this was sustained throughout the year um, with a longitudinal curriculum composed of five distinct small and large group sessions, reinforcing, building upon, and maintaining diagnostic reasoning skills. Control data was collected from the 2014-2015 cohort of residents and then compared to the 2016-2017 class after the uh, diagnostic reasoning curriculum was implemented in the 2015 academic year. 81 residents total were present in each arm of the cohort, or in each arm of the study. The primary outcome was change in resident scores on the diagnostic thinking inventory. This is a 41-question validated self-assessment tool composed of two domains, flexibility of thinking and then structure of thinking. And then what the authors did is they broke down these questions into four author-defined subcategories. These being data acquisition, problem representation, hypothesis generation, and illness script selection. Data for the control and the intervention cohort were taken from the same time point in the academic year, so as to control for experience on the primary outcome. And I've included the first three questions of this 41 question test. Um, and how staff were asked to mark where along the spectrum of behaviors they fell when they approached their patients. And this would then be translated into a score that would be used in the final analysis. Each question corresponded to only one of the two domains and only one of the four defined author subcategories. So, for example, in the first question, this corresponded to the structure of thinking domain and problem representation subcategory, whereas the second question corresponded to the flexibility of thinking domain um, and the illness script subcategory. The maximum score on the diagnostic thinking inventory as a whole was 246. In terms of the results, after implementing this novel curriculum, um, mean total diagnostic thinking inventory scores improved for house staff from pre- to post-intervention, but were significant at the PGY1 level only, with an average 15-point increase from pre- to post-intervention. Similarly, in terms of the two domains of the diagnostic thinking inventory, flexibility of thinking showed a significant improvement for PGY1 house staff, and structure of thinking showed a significant increase for both PGY1 and PGY2 house staff, although the comparative increase was greater at the PGY1 level. And then, when broken down into the four author-defined subcategories, again, PGY1 house staff were largely the ones who benefited from this novel curriculum. In terms of the problem representation subcategory, PGY2s also showed a significant increase. And then notably, in the illness script subcategory, no one showed a significant increase. PGY3 house staff also did not demonstrate a significance in any of the four author-defined subcategories. Harris and colleagues' study showed the results of implementing this novel curriculum with particular benefits seen at the PGY1 level. Limitations to the study include the moderate response rate ranging from the low 40s to the high 60s for various levels of house staff, as well as the fact that self-assessment of diagnostic reasoning skills were used as opposed to objective third-party assessment. The findings from the study kind of prompt the question of how best to benefit PGY3s in terms of their diagnostic reason. And the authors point out that PGY3s, as advanced as they are, likely require higher level challenges. Um, and so after reading this article, I was left wondering, hey, what effect would PGY3's teaching diagnostic reasoning have on their own clinical skills? Nonetheless, Harris and colleagues, they implement a novel, effective curriculum, and they successfully measure its outcomes, an all-around effective approach um, to implementing di a diagnostic reasoning curriculum. Our second article deals with using patient assessments to evaluate resident professionalism. Faculty-resident relationships are often short-term, whereas house staff are going to take care of numerous patients over the course of their residency who are going to directly witness their bedside behaviors. The challenge to this is that patient evaluations are not always objective, and they can be influenced by numerous external factors, some of which may be on resident control. The second article by Rattel and colleagues um, from the Mayo Clinic examines the contextual factors affecting resident professionalism evaluations by patients. 
This was a single center prospective cohort study occurring across four general medicine inpatient services at the Mayo Clinic Rochester campus. Patients and their evaluations were only included in this study if house staff were, had taken care of them for at least two days during their hospitalization. Patients were excluded if they were not English speaking, if they were, pris if they were prisoners, or if they were CAM positive. A 12 question survey was created and iteratively refined by medical, medical education experts at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and they used assessment tools that were created by the American Board of Internal Medicine as well as the University of Pennsylvania. After data was collected, one question was dropped during factor analysis, yielding 11 final core questions that would subsequently be used in the association analysis. Survey data on resident professionalism was subsequently correlated with three categories of covariates for 25 covariates total. Key ones looked at included patient characteristics, such as age and education level, hospitalization characteristics, such as patient resident gender pairing, as well as patient satisfaction with their hospital stay, and then resident characteristics, including categorical versus prelim status, markers of resident professionalism, as well as ACGME milestone um, evaluations. The authors estimated that 250 patient assessments corresponding to three and a half assessments for each of the 72 residents would achieve an 80% power to detect a correlation of at least 0.35 for any of the 25 covariates. At the end of the study, a total of 409 unique patient evaluations of the 72 residents were completed. Mean professionalism scores on each of these 11 questions were high ranging from 4.45 to 4.65 out of a five-point scale. In the multivariate model, after adjusting for the other covariates, only patient satisfaction with their hospital stay correlated with how they evaluated resident professionals with a beta regression coefficient of 0 0.8. No other measure of resident professionalism, including objective measures, such as ACGME milestone performance, correlated with patient assessment scores. Rotel and colleagues have conducted a high-quality study showing that there is, in fact, a correlation between the external factor of patient satisfaction with their hospital stay and how they evaluate resident professionalism. The limitation here, as one might imagine, is that correlation does not equal causation, and the direction between this correlation of, or with their, of with their satisfaction with their hospital stay and their assessment with, of resident professionalism is not really elucidated in the study. The authors point out that professionalism, eva professionalism evaluation is complex, and patient assessment of residents can often be influenced by external features that are outside of resident or even physician control. Nonetheless, what the study does so well is it takes a complex question and it, it, and it examines it with a high level of statistical rigor providing it nearly every opportunity, validity, evidence, and sound methodology to come up with a validated conclusion. Hats off to the, to the investigators at the Mayo Clinic for a well-designed study. Our final article looks at pimping in medical education. This is a controversial technique. It often elicits polarized opinions on its value in medical education. And our last article by McAvoy and colleagues from the Johns Hopkins Hospital and Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center take a look at the behavior of pimping at the faculty level. Their study asks the question, what are faculty perceptions on using pimping as a medical education technique? And then, what characteristics make faculty prone or not prone to using pimping in their practice? In doing so, the authors aim to create a quantitative scoring system um, and to characterize faculty propensity to, propensity to using this educational style. The authors here define pimping as repeatedly asking challenging questions to reveal medical knowledge deficiencies that may result in embarrassment for trainees. This was a cross-sectional study um, occurring at two academic medical centers, Johns Hopkins Hospital and Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center, of all faculty who attended on the inpatient wards for at least two weeks out of the academic year. The survey was designed and iteratively refined by faculty experts in medical education, yielding a pilot survey of 25 questions. After two rounds of pilot testing and modification based on feedback, there was a final survey of 11 core questions and two attitudinal questions that, exa that directly examined the pimping construct. The outcomes and objectives of the survey were threefold. First, what are faculty perceptions on pimping? And this was based on response 
on either a positive or negative response to the attitudinal question, being pimped by my trainees helped me learn, or being pimped by my teachers helped me learn when I was a medical trainee. The second was to characterize faculty as having a quote unquote pimper or non-pimper phenotype. And this pimper phenotype was those who scored in the top quartile um, of the quantitative survey. And the last was to, uh, was to correlate characterizations with other variables. And these variables included demographic variables of age, sex, race, practice variables such as academic versus community hospital setting, or journalist versus specialist designation, and then interestingly, personal variables such as quality of life, feelings of callousness, or even a positive depression screen. Um, the total score on this survey uh, ranged from 11 to 50 uh, and was based on responses to Likert scales receiving one point for never to six points for always for frequency questions and one point for strongly disagree to four point for strongly agree uh, for agreement questions. An exploratory analysis prior to the survey dissemination was conducted to faculty with a known propensity either to pimping their trainees or not and it demonstrated that there were statistically higher scores in those faculty who self-acknowledged a propensity towards pimping. Survey response rate was 84% of eligible faculty, with 45% of faculty recording a positive attitude towards pimping based on response to that attitudinal question. This was more likely to be seen in the academic hospital setting, in specialists as compared with generalists. And then curiously, there was actually a trend towards responses in those who reported feelings of callousness, although this did not reach statistical significance. And then amazingly, they, they created the PIMP score, which had a mean and median of 24, with a largely normal distribution. The PIMPER phenotype, again, the top quartile um, on the score, achieved a score of at least 28. After adjusting for age, gender, and race, the PIMPER phenotype was more likely to be seen in younger faculty, with 5% lower odds per year increase in age as well as, again, in the academic hospital setting, in specialists, um, and then, interestingly, in those who reported a lower quality of life. The PIMPER phenotype also positively correlated with the two direct attitudinal questions towards pimping, providing additional validity evidence for this survey. Um, I thought this was one of the most interesting studies that I read this year in medical education. It does a great job taking a simple question and coming up with an experiment around it providing validity evidence for that experiment, and then coming up with a conclusion, as well as proposing additional uh, experiments, saying that this can be used at the learner level to measure outcomes. Hats off to the investigators at Johns Hopkins Hospital and Johns Hopkins Baby Medical Center for one of my favorite surveys of this year. Um, I'm going to see if there's any questions. I minimized this window. How do I get up back? Lovely. And I'll turn it over to Stephanie Hall for the final portion of this. So I have a couple of really interesting articles um, to review, and I promise to keep us on time, so I will go through them fairly quickly. They're very simple. Um, and the topic that I'm going to address is recruiting and applications, which is a hot topic now, and this, a couple of the articles that came out were really um, very well timed. So the first is a really interesting article um, written by a group from Houston at Baylor. They did a wonderful study called Bridging the Gap, Holistic Review to Increasing Diversity in Graduate Medical Education. Holistic Review is a very hot topic in both UME and GME. Um, background for this is there's a lack of diversity in the physician workforce and that that is a contributing factor to healthcare disparities. WMC has addressed this in their 2009 recommendations and enhanced um, over time um, to support increasing racial and ethnic diversity in the U.S. physician workforce. Part of this, they suggest, is performing holistic reviews in the admissions process. They define a holistic review as a flexible, individualized way of assessing an applicant's capabilities by which balanced consideration is given to experiences, attributes, and academic metrics. However, there's limited research on the implementation of holistic review in graduate medical education. So the question in this study was, does the introduction of a holistic review into the application screening process lead to an increased number of IM residents who are underrepresented in medicine, and we use the abbreviation URM. So this was a pilot conducted in this single program in Houston. It's very much like our program. It's a categorical um, program with approximately 40 interns per year, so a little bit larger. They typically get 3,500 applications per year, very much like our program. Um, typically review 800 to 1,200 and invite 350 to 400 um, 
uh, interviewees each year. In 2016 and 17, they partnered with their Office of Diversity and Inclusion and developed this pilot. Their goal is to increase the URM number. Um, URM is self-identified on the ARIS application, and their outcomes were to increase the proportion of URM, URM applicants, applicants reviewed, interviews, and matriculants. And they did this over two years and compared it to their 2015-16 data. The changes that they made in year one um, with regards to the interview were day, inter changes to the interview day. They added census data to their program overviews highlighting diversity. They made explicit statements during the interview day regarding a commitment to recruiting and training a diverse group of residents reflective of the city population. And they engaged URM faculty champions. In year two, they added unconscious bias training for all faculty members interviewing and incorporated standardized interview questions focused on behaviors, much like our behavioral interviewing questions. They also made changes in year two to the way that they reviewed applications. They introduced the holistic review process. This was driven by institutional missions and aims. Their institutional mission and aims were around finding important experiences and attributes aligning with life experiences that demonstrate commitment to serving the underserved, substantial leadership roles, Spanish language fluency, and, thing, and looking for people that represented the city's diverse population. They implemented the holistic review for applicants who would not have previously met their screening criteria, which were around a USMLE score. So they went about 10 points below their usual cutoff. And for the people that fell within that range, the selection committee assigned points for experience and attributes in those four categories. And they considered that as they selected for the interview process. When you look at their outcomes, here you see the percent URM applications, then percent URM application reviewed, percent URM interviewed, and percent URM matriculated. And in the waves of the columns going back, it's by year. So the very darkest column is that last academic year, 2017-18. And you can see, particularly in the column all the way over to the right, the percent URM matriculated dip tripled over this two-year process, which is incredibly impressive. Um, if we could do something like this, we'd be publishing it too. Um, and that over 30% of their incoming class in academic year 2017 and 18 met the criteria for URM. When implementing their holistic review, they identified 138 applicants who would not have otherwise been considered, and 35% and of that group was subsequently interviewed based on the attribute score. Limitations to this study, this is a single institution study, single city experience. It's a specific strategy focused on a specific program and institutional mission, so we don't know how that might extrapolate to other programs. The volume of applications limits the ability to holistically review all applicants, so you can only really talk about that small subset. There's a lack of standardization in the interview process with regards to no um, standardized evaluation form. They did not evaluate how other unmeasured changes impacted their applicant characteristics during this time, um, and you're unable to establish causality. Implications, however, are huge. This is a low or no cost incremental set of incremental changes that can be made in the recruiting process at any program to enhance the recruitment of URM applicants. It increased, it truly did increase diversity in their programs, one of the only things that I've seen really establishing this. They did establish that a holistic review of applications is feasible, but it may have to be a focused holistic review, but that that was quite effective. Um, it highlights the importance of aligning the recruiting process with the institutional program mission. Certainly there's more work to be done in this area, but efforts to improve diversity, um, and they also comment that efforts to improve diversity are ineffective if not partnered with a culture of inclusion. The second article I want to highlight is an article looking at step 2 CK, um, the best predictor of multimodal performance in an internal medicine residency. This is, um, was published by a group at Cincinnati led by Eric Warren, who might be the smartest program director in the country by far. Um, background here, the applicant process for residency involves screening large amounts of data, significant reliance on USMLE scores, particularly step one, which is fascinating right now during the controversial decision that step one is going to pass fail. So this is a really critical article now. Um, there's an increasing dissatisfaction in the process, both from a program standpoint, school standpoint, and a student standpoint. And there's a desire to identify measures that truly predict performance. So the question asked here by Warman colleagues, which application materials best predict performance across a broad array of residency assessment outcomes? Their methods, they looked at this in a single program, University of Cincinnati, which has 25 residents per categorical um, program class. They included all of the categorical residents matriculating. They excluded prelims, combined program trainees, and transfers. 
The data that they looked at included very specific um, pieces of data in the ARES um, application as listed here. They did not use class rank and clerkship grades due to the significant variability across schools. The performance data or outcomes data they looked at were multi-source assessments at the end of a year-long ambulatory block, um, including quantitative data, narrative data, which was competency-based, a multi-source assessment from peers, nurses, attending physicians, and then they also looked at direct patient assessment of each um, trainee. They also looked at in-training exam scores and ABIM certification status. This table presents, um, in the first column, all the ARIS data points that they considered, and then across the top, you can see the competency areas using the multi-source documents from the faculty and peer staff evaluations. On univariate analysis, the findings that were significant, primarily, as you see, focused in that third row, USMLE 2, where you found a significant association with each competency on multi-source. Um, and then when we did multivariate analysis, only USMLE Step 2 was significantly associated with all modes of multi-source assessment. So USMLE 2 was a huge driver when looking at the outcomes. When they looked at patient ratings, they found very similar things with regards to the association on univariate analysis with USMLE 2, significant associations with physician explains things to me, listens to me, gives me instructions, knows my history, respects me. Um, but also, as you see on univariate analysis, significant um, correlations with advanced degree and failure in medical school. In multivariate analysis, a higher step 2 CK and an advanced degree were significantly associated with higher patient ratings. When looking at the ITE and the ABIM multivariate analysis, step one score significantly predicted the in-training exam score, not unsurprising, but it was not associated with ABIM pass rate, whereas step two CK was associated with both. For every point increase in USMLE step two, the odds of passing your ABIM increases by approximately 7%. So limitations, single institution, um, did not consider all medical school application items, no patient level outcomes, did not weight medical school application items. Implications, step two CK performance correlates with test scores and an assessment of clinical competence. Few other measures were associated with future test scores or clinical competence, so step two CK may truly be the best predictor of resident performance, which is fascinating now that step one has gone to pass fail. So I'm not gonna go into the details of this last article. It is an article looking at a survey of internal medicine program directors, a national survey. I will share with you the findings, which are that percent of PDs reporting very important when looking at applications, notably USMLE step two. Um, the majority of program directors find that the one of the most important things, including and adding to it medicine grade, USMLE step one, the chair rank, the rank in the chair letter and the rank in the MSPE letter. This was interesting, percent of PDs reporting that they absolutely would not invite an applicant if, look at the bottom um, row here, there was a hint of any unprofessionalism anywhere in the application. 60, over 65% of program directors said they absolutely would not invite an applicant. Um, also, if a person fails step two CK or if there are negative comments in the MSPE. These are wonderful things as you help guide medical students who are applying to medicine programs. Um, so uh, IMPDs are really frustrated and looking for potential solutions to applicant inflation and these were some of the things that they were surveyed on. They suggest a limited number of applications per applicant, allowing applicants to indicate a high interest in a subset of programs, creating a national database of qualities of matched applicants for each programs, creating something like a rolling invitational system, um, and requiring program-specific personal statements of interest. I'm sure our students are gonna love that. So there were some limitations to this study, but significant um, implications to this study as well. The three of us would really, the four of us, would really like to thank our reviewers. We um, had a cadre of reviewers, as Claire suggested, that assisted with this work, um, and some lead people in really getting this work done. So we have uh, a couple of minutes for any specific questions that you have about any of the articles that we covered. I'm sure any of us would be happy to take those. We have additional questions. Okay. No idea how to get to those. Do you have enough? Okay. Let's see why. Avoid additional questions. See, it's not just me. Yeah, no, it was not. Okay. I hate your responses. 
uh, with the Harris study, wasn't the PGY2 pre-exposure score similar to the ending? I was wondering if the curriculum was a significant contributor to knowledge of the PGY1 post-data scores would be higher than the PGY2 pre-exposure data scores. Um, the PGY2 post-exposure scores, uh, let's see, going back, let me actually call up the slides here. Okay, so the question is here, um, if the curriculum actually had any implication, shouldn't um, this score be higher than, than the scores here? I, I think that's a valid criticism. Um, there, might, there probably is some impact based on exp, uh, experience. Um, if you look over here, there does seem to, the post-intervention score does seem to be higher. It just it doesn't seem to be significantly different. Um, and, then th and thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was compared at the same time. I think you're okay. I don't see that. There are no p there are p values in the table. I'm not sure. Thank you to every everyone because we are out of time, so we are going to close this now. <laughs>